hopefully those make sense to you. And like I said, we'll, we'll spend some time in class uh, going through some of these. So how do we establish a causal link? So far, we've just been talking about associations. How do we actually establish a causal link? Now, you've learned about this in school, uh, and this is really the most tried and true method for establishing, establishing causation, and that's an experiment. In particular, what we're going to be calling a randomized experiment. So in an experiment, the researcher actively manipulates one or more explanatory variables. So that's the idea of an experiment more generally, is that the researcher actively manipulates one or more uh, explanatory variables. In the case of a randomized experiment, what the researcher is going to do is he's going to randomly, he or she is going to randomly assign the levels of the explanatory variables. So they will randomly assign them. And this will come up again. <clears throat> In contrast to an experiment, most of the research studies that you've heard about, that you've learned about, and that are presented in the news are observational. And in an observational study, the researcher doesn't actively manipulate anything. They don't go in there and change an explanatory variable. They just look at what's happening and they observe whether or not something changes or not. And that's an observational study. Just... So you may be wondering, or maybe, maybe you're not, but maybe you're wondering, well, why would we even bother to do observational studies if we can't show causation? If we're doing science, we want to be able to show causal relationships. Well, in some situations, we just can't manipulate the explanatory variable. So think about these cases down here. Does a baseball team's payroll increase the number of wins in a season? Well, can we, can we just assign to a baseball team their sal uh, the total amount of money they have to uh, use for their payroll? No, we can't do that. Does cigarette smoking cause lung cancer? Can I tell some people that you should smoke cigarettes and you won't and you will participate in my study? And if you develop lung cancer, yes or no, um, this, is, this is sort of like what the, the purpose of the study is. C could I do something like that? Of course not. There are ethical issues with, with assigning somebody to be a smoker or not when we believe that there's a link between um, smoking and cancer. Is human activity causing the earth to warm? Well, again, we can't, we can't randomly assign uh, or we can't assign various human activity. So we can't really say conclusively that there's causation. Now, <clears throat> I want to be really careful here, particularly about this, uh, these last two points here. Because while we may not be able to assign people to smoke, and while we may not be able to assign activities, human activities, to explore these two different scenarios, that doesn't mean that, these, that, that there isn't evidence of causation. So when you do enough studies under a variety of different scenarios, and your results hold up again and again and again and again, that is evidence, in fact, that there is a causal relationship, right? So, we, so most people agree that there is, in fact, human-induced global warming. And even if we can't do an experiment to, to examine this and prove conclusively that, there's, uh, uh, that there is, in fact, a causal link between the two, most people agree with this. And this is based on numerous observational studies. Same thing with lung cancer and cigarette smoking. Numerous, numerous studies have found this, even if they haven't been able to do experiments. <clears throat> so sort of as giving you an example of a study that I was involved in. So I was involved in the sea otter study. We've talked about it once before. Um, <clears throat> so in this situation, what we did is we were observing sea otters and we were observing what they were eating. We were observing their mating habits. We were observing their survival. We didn't do anything to actually go in there and um, manipulate things. We didn't, uh, you know, uh, manipulate what their food items were. We didn't go and manipulate who they could breed with. We never did any sort of active manipulation. So we never did an experimental study. In fact, we just did what this, uh, what this researcher here is doing. We looked through a telescope out into the ocean every single day, and we looked for sea otters, and we recorded what they were doing. So it was entirely observational. <clears throat> now, let's contrast this with an experiment. And I want to mention here, I, I say characteristics of an experiment. In my class, an experiment a, a good experiment is going to be involved randomized be a randomized experiment.
And so the characteristics of, of this, of what I would say is a good experiment is that the value of the explanatory variable for each unit is going to be randomly assigned. And so that is inherently the idea behind a randomized experiment. And then that way you can say conclusively that there's, you can show causal links. You can have causal links show causation. And I should point out too that this is causal, not casual. Uh, it's, it's not uncommon that students move the U and the S around and they think that it says casual, but it's cause, causal. So this, this by using randomized, randomly assigning the value of your explanatory variable, what this does is it ensures that the explanatory variable at the onset, at the start of the study, is unrelated to any other variables except just by chance alone. And that's really important. Okay. <clears throat> and as an example of an explanatory variable, maybe you're a, a researcher and you're trying to look at the effectiveness of a new drug versus a standard drug. So what you might do uh, for, for some outcome, and let's say your outcome is survival after five years. So your response variable is survival after five years, and your explanatory variable is our new drug or the standard drug. So what you're going to do is you're going to take in a bunch of a bunch of participants, you're going to randomly assign them your new drug, you're going to randomly assign them the standard drug, and then you're going to look and see which group survives more on average. And that's basically what the experiment's going to be about. So <clears throat> some characteristics that are important for, uh, for experiments are to have blind. So um, in the situation of, of uh, situations where uh, participants do not know what um, treatment they've been assigned to or what value of the explanatory they, variable they've been assigned to, that's known as being blind. In the situation where it's both the participants and the researchers, that's what's known as being double blind. And in some cases, you even have something called triple blind, which is when the subjects, the researchers, and the statisticians doing the analyses on the studies don't know which participants were assigned which values of the explanatory variable. Now, I already mentioned that experiments often involve sort of like a explanatory variable that maybe is like a new drug versus a standard, or in the case of many situations, it could be a treatment and the control condition. So in my example, my treatment would have been the new drug, the control would have been sort of that standard. Um, sometimes um, <clears throat> a control isn't always necessary, um, but we want to have a valid comparison. And so sometimes people will use placebos to do this. And so placebo, you can sort of think of as like a sugar pill. You know, it's basically a fake pill or a fake treatment so that people think that they're getting the real treatment. And that's important because uh, the way in which we perceive the outcome or the way in which we perceive what condition we're in can actually have really profound impacts on our outcome. Um, there's a really strong effect of the placebo. So sometimes what we'll do in experiments is we will allow subjects to both receive the treatment as well as the control. And then this is what's known as a matched pairs experiment. And we will assign the treatment and the control, or maybe we have a treatment one and a treatment two, and we will assign them in random order to our participants. So let's talk about an interesting experiment. And this is such an interesting experiment to me because this is basically a sample size of one. So in this pretty ingenious experiment, uh, this researcher was looking at nutrients in lakes, and I will read the abstract. So combinations of phosphorus, nitrogen, and carbon were added to several small lakes in northwestern Ontario, Canada, at rates similar to those in many culturally eutrophied lakes. So I don't know if you, if you all know what eutrophied means or eutrophication, but basically it's when there is a big, a lot of nutrients that flow into a lake and it causes a big growth of algae. And it can cause algal blooms, which can cause all sorts of negative outcomes for the lakes, including reducing the amount of oxygen in the water so that fish end up dying, the water gets toxic, and things like that. So in this experiment, phosphate and nitrate caused rapid eutrophication. A similar result was obtained with phosphate, ammonia, and sucrose. But recovery rate was recovery was almost immediate when phosphate additions were when phosphate additions only were discontinued. When two basins of one lake were fertilized with equal amounts of nitrate and sucrose and phosphorus was also added to one of the basins, the phosphate enriched basin quickly became highly eutrophic, while the basin receiving only nitrogen carbon remained at pre-fertilization conditions. 
The results in the high affinity of sediments for phosphorus indicate that rapid abatement of eutrophication may be expected to follow phosphorus control measures. So this ingenious experiment, which is, I wouldn't say questionable, but it's, it's kind of amazing, um, and, but it was done on one lake. So basically, this, this researcher took a lake. He took um, one basin. So let's say that the, my line here breaks into the lake into two basins. In one basin, he, he dumped phosphorus. In the other basin, he didn't. So yes, it's here. No, it's not. So in the lake, that, that on the side that had the phosphorus, this became eutrophied. So there was a bunch of algae growing. And so because of this particular study, he was able to link phosphates to, um, to algal growth, to eutrophication. And because of that, phosphates were banned in things like um, detergents just because of this, this study. And this was a sample size of one. So it's kind of an amazing study to me because it's so powerful and it involved such a few number of cases and units, right? The cases and the units are a single lake. So it's kind of amazing. <clears throat> this is an image of what eutrophication looks like. This is Lake Erie. Um, so this is like New York. And if I circle right here, this is Buffalo and Niagara. I don't think it has the U. I think it's just Buffalo like that. Um, but you can see the eutrophication right here. This is all algae growing. It's quite amazing that you can see it from the from the uh, uh, from a satellite image like this. It's really it's quite awful. 